Hello, Jeff Zwerink here. Welcome back to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas and see how they relate to the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined again by founder and president of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're going to be looking and trying to understand why does Earth have so much oxygen in its atmosphere? Hugh, it's good to have you here today. Thank you for having me back. So when we look out, one of the, the basic features of Earth is it's got this very large component of oxygen, about 20% oxygen in its atmosphere. And it, and it just seems kind of obvious that it's there. Um, how do we go about understanding where this oxygen came from in our atmosphere? Well, there's lots of evidence that the oxygen in our atmosphere comes from photosynthetic light. But the problem is, as uh, you know, this photosynthetic light produces oxygen, it gets continually absorbed uh, by the animals. It gets continually absorbed by other plants. And also it gets uh, uh, sucked up into the minerals that make up the core of the earth. And so, yeah, for 3.8 billion years, we've had photosynthetic light pumping oxygen in the atmosphere, but it's removed almost as rapidly as it's produced. Uh, and so there's been a, an enigma. How is it that we have all this oxygen in the atmosphere and why do we see these sudden jumps in the oxygen content in the atmosphere? Because if you get a sudden jump, then it seems to stabilize again, and you get another jump. And so that's kind of what's new. We now have a deep understanding of how that happens. So, so that's pretty fascinating because oxygen, it just seems basic to life, or at least uh, human life, if you will. And so uh, kind of there's this default position of, oh, it's just been around a long time. But, but you're saying something pretty important there is that there's things that produce oxygen, but there's also, I know oxygen to be a pretty reactive element. And so there's a lot of things that absorb it from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so has Earth had oxygen in its, his or in its atmosphere for most of its history? Well, it's had oxygen in its atmosphere for most of the history of life on planet Earth. Uh, but for most of that history, it's been at a very low abundance level. And uh, you know, we refer to the great oxygenation events that basically bumped up the oxygen content. And because you've got photosynthetic life continuously existing on the Earth, if you bump up the oxygen content, it doesn't drop back down. It stays up, and then you get another bump. And we now understand what bumps it up. Okay, so if you look, so if you go back over the four and a half billion year history or 3.8 billion years where there's been abundant life, you've got very low levels of oxygen and then you see these stepwise increases. Uh, how many of these steps can we identify at this point in time? Well, we can identify four and the new research basically gives us an understanding of the first two of these great oxygenation events. So, so kind of give us the time scale of when did they happen? And if we start from very low levels and get up to roughly 20% oxygen in the atmosphere, roughly when did they occur and what were the sizes of the steps, if you will? Well, 2.4 billion years ago is when you get the first great oxygenation event. And that's where you go from say one thousandth of a percent oxygen in the atmosphere where it jumps up to somewhere between one and two and a half percent. And the other big one you get is about uh, 580 million years ago, where it jumps up from about 1% or 2% up to 8%. And then you get one where it jumps up to 10%, and another one where it jumps up to the current 20 to 21%. Okay, so let's kind of dig in. How do we understand how these oxygenation events happen? I mean, you, you said that you've got photosynthetic synthetic organisms producing all of this oxygen. So why is it that these steps occurred? Well, if you go to the first two great oxygenation events, what we see is that there's this enormous uh, push of continental landmass material into the oceans. So you get this huge amount of eroded material or catastrophically ma uh, dumped material into the oceans. And because of the plate tectonics, uh, this stuff is being subducted uh, into the mantle of the earth. And uh, what is new is they now understand uh, that as you get this great, huge dumping of uh, continental landmass material in the ocean, within that is a lot of organic carbon. And so this now gets subducted uh, into the uh, mantle. And when it's being subducted, you have all this dissolved water 
and dissolved carbon dioxide uh, that's in this uh, continental material. And then when it gets subducted into the mantle, a chemical reaction occurs where that dissolved water and dissolved carbon dioxide uh, becomes uh, formaldehyde and oxygen. And then the formaldehyde gets broken down into carbon and water. And how they discovered this is they were finding stuff coming up on the mantle that was pure carbon, graphite and diamonds. And I was like, how do we get all these diamonds and graphite coming up on the mantle? Well, because of this chemical reaction that occurs uh, when you get this huge amount of uh, you know, organic material uh, being subducted uh, into the earth. And we now have good geological evidence that indeed there was a massive infusion of continental landmass material uh, 2.4 billion years ago. And another one that you find in all the geology textbooks, it's called the Great Unconformity. Uh, when you again have this huge landslides all over the earth, dumping huge amounts of continental landmass material uh, into the oceans about 580 million years ago. And uh, you know, with that transformation of water and carbon dioxide uh, into formaldehyde and oxygen, you get this big pulse of oxygen uh, being released through volcanoes uh, into the atmosphere, and that causes these big jumps that you see in the oxygen content. So, so that's that's actually very fascinating because if I understand what you're saying, um, there are things on the surface of the Earth that are producing oxygen, but you also have these sinks where carbon is reacting with the oxygen and forming carbon dioxide or something. But as that is subducted deep into the Earth, there are processes at play there that actually sequester the carbon deep in the Earth and bring the oxygen back up to the surface. So you've got the photosynthetic production of oxygen, but you also have this a biological production of oxygen uh, that is enhancing or bumping up the the process. So it's actually the entire entire functioning of the earth that is making the oxygen, if you will. Is that what you're saying? Well, they both have a biotic origin because what you've got is a lot of dead organic material that's been buried into the earth on the continents. And you've got these massive tectonic events that pull all that into the ocean. And then it gets subducted. But the net factor is you get this huge release of oxygen uh, from that material, and you also get diamonds. So hey, I know your wife has a, an, a, a wedding ring, and there's a diamond there, and uh, that diamond wouldn't be there unless this kind of tectonic reaction was going on. Well, thanks, you. I appreciate your comments. You know, we do take oxygen for granted here on Earth because without it, we wouldn't exist. But when we look at the history of Earth, we see that the production of an abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere is a remarkable synthesis of biological, geological, astronomical, uh, atmospheric processes working to produce an, a, an atmosphere where we can be here and live. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Hugh's latest blog on this. Deep Oxygen Cycle provides evidence for the creation of animals. And you'll see the, just the beauty and the, the splendor of this whole process, as well as how it points to the creator who fashioned us so that we can know him, so that you can go out and tell others about this amazing creator.